Here we go. Well, good morning, Kirk Buchanan. Thank you for being with me this morning. Uh, Kirk and Mindy are uh, active members at Holy Trinity by the Lake here in Heath. And when they're not in Heath, they're in Taos, New Mexico at Kirk's artist studio where he is today. Uh, it's always good to see you, but good to see you this morning. And thanks for making time for this conversation. Oh, thank you so much. I'm looking forward to it. So Kirk, you're in your artist studio. We're looking at artwork behind you. Um, Tell us about your work as an artist for those who don't know that side of you. Yeah, because um, it is kind of an alter ego uh, of mine. And I just, I, I love making art. I love working with oils primarily. I do oil paintings on canvas. Uh, I enjoy painting the landscapes of the great American Southwest. Uh, that's just what inspires me, the natural beauty of creation. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, um, I, I can't, be in this part of the country and see nature and not think how amazing God is for creating so much for us that we not only get to enjoy, but we're also here to protect and take care of. How long have you been painting? Um, it's funny, kind of on and off for a long time. I really started painting 25, 30 years ago, and then I took about a 20 year break. Oh, wow. <laughs> really picked it up again about five years ago and started um, painting a lot. I love the different artists you uh, evoke with with some of your different styles here. Uh, this one makes Van me Gogh, think of Van Gogh uh, and Cezanne. Van Gogh is definitely a, uh, one that I, I enjoy his approach. Um, you know, he was one that was totally unappreciated during his entire life, sold one painting. Um, oh my gosh. After his death that people started to appreciate how he was really pushing the boundaries at that time. So I do like the way he um, uses color and um, he's through a different lens than a lot of people normally do. So Kirk, we're in the, the second of our three week series on kind of taking Mako Fujimura as our, our inspiration background, this evangelical the theologian artist and He's talking about the what he calls the theology of making, but on a very uh, simple and human level, what does the act of making mean to you? Well, to me, art art is not a product. It's not a thing. It's not a painting. It's really the process. It's the journey. Um, it's this grand experiment in my perception of the world around me. It's my own unique perspective that I get to share in my very own way. Mm. Uh, and I get to share that with another person. And, you know, you can look at a landscape different times of the day, and it's a totally different picture. The, the, the angle of a shadow from a tree, um, the color of that shadow. It's amazing how much purple you'll see in mm. a shadow if you're trying to paint it. If you're not trying to paint it, you don't notice the purple. And so, you know, art opens this special door for me to connect with God's creation, to see it in a way that you don't see it when you're just passing by. Um, you know, one of, another one of God's creations is people. And mm. art allows me to connect with people. And that makes art really personal. And being here in the gallery today, for an example, and people will come in and, uh, and look at it, and I'll have a chance to talk to them. And... Um, share just that little snippet of how I'm just appreciating God and all of his majesty and all of his glory uh, in the way that I paint. And in a very subtle way, I, I'm able to share that message as well. It's, that's beautiful. And uh, there, there's something that you're naming, Kirk, that I, I want, wonder if I can ask you more about. You're sharing this unique perspective, something that, that only you have to, to express. And it's a process so it's something you are expressing, but not controlling, expressing, but it's also this discovery at the same time. And I wonder if you could talk about that balance or that tension. Yeah, it is a balance and a tension and it's amazing. I don't know if I've ever painted anything that turned about turned out to be what I initially started painting. Mm. Um, you get pulled in different directions and um, people who have ever tried any kind of art understand what I'm talking about that 
Um, you come up with new ideas along the way that you never thought of. Um, but yeah, there's a tension there as well because you thought you messed up and in reality, you took a path that you weren't expecting. Which, which is a good word for those of us who are inclined to uh, judge our processes prematurely or, or judge our, ourselves or our lives at, at different intervals. Uh, may, maybe this is related, but feel free to take this in whatever direction you'd like. What are the best and, and most challenging aspects of creating for you? Yeah, I think um, true art includes that often uncomfortable action of putting it out there in the world for people to appreciate or criticize or completely ignore. Um, I can't keep it to myself and call it art. Mm. It must be shared. And to me, that's the definition of art. It must be shared. If you have been doing art in the closet and keeping it to yourself, <laughs> great, and, and maybe, you know, you don't have to agree with me, but that's not art. It's not art until you put it out there. Um, and each person then who's, who, with whom it's been shared, um, they get to interact with it the way they want. They can like it, they can love it, they can hate it, uh, they can despise it, they can be impressed by it, they can be totally unimpressed by it, they can be indifferent, intrigued, irritated. And, and I can't tell you how many times I'll see people walk in this gallery and just walk right past, just kind of glance and keep going. I'm like, oh, I guess you didn't like that stuff. <laughs> And that's okay. It wasn't for you then. And, um, you know, once I've released it into the world, each person who interacts with it um, sees it through their own perspective. And so in their own unique um, perception of the world around them, just like creating it was my own unique perception of the world around me, everyone gets to appreciate it or not the way that they want. And that's great. It doesn't have to be good even. Mm. I, I paint a lot of stuff that's not good. <laughs> and then what, what really just floors me is I think, you know what, I'm going to put it over here in this little discount box. People buy it and they love it. Mm. And I think, you know what, that it was for you then. It wasn't for me. It wasn't for someone else. And it, it spoke to them, I guess, you know, the artists say it spoke to you um, in some way. And um so that's kind of cool. It's a, don't don't judge yourself too harshly. Make art, and then let it let it do what it does. I, lo I love your what you said just now in relation to what you said at the outset about art being a journey and a process. Because you're imagining that process is not ending with you and the the finished piece. That's a process that continues uh, interacting. The, the people who interact with it later, in some sense, become a, a part of the process, and so become a part of the art. Mm -hmm. And it makes me think of uh, different stories in scripture, like uh, Joseph and his brothers. One of my favorite uh, scholars on forgiveness has said, you know, they, they famously have their big forgiveness scene where Joseph forgives his brothers for leaving him for dead and then trading him off into slavery. Uh, but he says that that forgiveness we're oftentimes think of as like, well, you better forgive because it doesn't it's not, you don't forgive for the other person, you forgive for yourself and those kind of things. But he's like, to imagine it as stopping between them and that sphere is to miss the whole reason why that story gets told to us. Mm -hmm. Because their forgiveness becomes the gift of the, in, in generations later, becomes the gift of the 12 tribes of Israel, becomes the whole story of the, the context for Jesus, becomes the whole landscape for the gospel. That wasn't anything that was imagined in that moment. Uh, that was just a part of that unfolding process. So your art becomes something that is tangible, people look at, but also literally changes the landscape of the world in, in some really profound way that um, maybe gives us a little bit of a, a, a foothold for understanding this language of new creation that the, the gospel gives us. What, what have you learned, Kirk, about um, some... Makato talks about being created in the image of a creator to create. What have you learned about our creator, the nature of this creator who inspires all that we make after God's making us? He's very detailed. Mm. Um, 
he uses a large brush in some places and he uses this teeny tiny little brush in other places as he creates and it's amazing when i look out at a scene through my artist eye i'm amazed at all of the details of creation if we just stop and look just stop for a minute and look at all of the colors isn't it cool that god decided to make all of this in color he could have chosen black and white but he <laughs> chose color and that was a gift you know so we get to see it and appreciate and the diversity of life and the trees and the animals and the insects and the plants and the water you know you go out into a, a forest and you set up and you want to paint this scene you start discovering how many thousands of different colors of green there are just mm. green um so everything i make i'm making using the ingredients that god had already made from nothing you know some artists like to talk about how they make their own paints from scratch using linseed oil and pigments and chromium oxide and they mix all this stuff and the reality is we're all using stuff that God already made. Mm. We, we don't get to create anything out of nothing. We're all using, even our brains, the creative abilities that we have to think up new ways to look at a thing or talk about a thing, or write poetry. It's from this gift, this creation that God already made first. And he's the only one who truly created anything. We're all just copycats. And some of us are good copycats and some of us are bad copycats, but we're trying to just appreciate what he created through our copycat actions. At least that's kind of how I look at what I do. I'm just copycatting what he so, already created. So would you, would you say, Kirk, that your, your making and your creating is, a, is an act of gratitude? Oh, yeah, absolutely. It's definitely an act of worship. It is, it's an act of appreciation. Um, it's a, it, it, it causes me to stop long enough to appreciate the creation. Because in my other alter ego, <laughs> I've talked about my art itself. I'm yeah. a 401k and pension guy. You know, I work with big companies and uh, organizations to put together retirement plans for their, for their people. And so it's a left brain, right brain kind of, you know, um, totally. Approach. Yeah. And so the art really does. Um, Help me stop for a minute and look at this amazing God that um, created us. I, I want to ask you about practicing two things. Are, are there ways that you have experienced practicing attention, uh, practicing noticing? Um, mm -hmm. Or has it always come just sort of like in your bones? Um, and, and the, you know, let me just ask that one and then I'll ask my other one. Um, no, I think it's a, I think we get so busy in our um, American life that um, we have to stop to take time to appreciate. Um, we have to do it on purpose. We can sometimes be forced to stop. God will stop us to get our attention. Mm. Um, I have learned that God will allow just about anything to happen to you sometimes just to get your attention. And, um, but I've, I've got into a better habit, especially during these COVID, um, you know, this year of COVID of getting up in the morning and going outside and sitting and drinking my coffee and um, reading and starting off with some liturgy and, and just appreciating the day, watching the sun rise and the different colors of the sky as it changes from moment to moment. I look around me sometimes and I'll see an ant and then I'll see some other bug and then I'll see a rabbit go across there and a squirrel there and a bird. And I can't remember now, but I remember one morning in a period of a minute, I think I counted 30 something different living kind of creatures that crossed my path. Oh, wow. And it's, it's an amazing thing when you stop and just pay attention for a few seconds. Um, so yeah, but I don't, it, it certainly doesn't happen with me automatically. Um, I have to do it on purpose. That, the other question, I, I wanted to kind of go back a half step to something you said a few minutes ago about art is only art when once you share it. Um, how do you practice, like, you know, because you're describing people coming into your gallery and like, huh, or wow, and how do you practice making space for their response to be whatever it is? 
because I imagine, I remember, so preacher's analogy, I remember when I was learning to preach, my dad, who's also an Episcopal priest, he, he said, uh, so after I preached, this before I was ordained, he said, now you have to go back to the door and greet everyone, because that's part of what preaching is, that it's a public act, it's not just your thoughts, like, broadcast out, it's, it's a conversation, it's a process, and it's relationship, and I was painfully shy, I did not want to have people comment on me bearing my soul in public. <laughs> What, what helped me is I noticed in that process that there were some people who come through the line expecting not to be seen or interacted with. And, um, and a lot of them were children. And, and it helped me realize that my, my role in that part of the process was to make others visible and let them know that they are visible to God and loved by God. And that, that kind of helped me make space. But, uh, but art, I mean, you're, I mean, you're you're spending thousands of hours and then it just becomes something for someone to kind of take or leave. How do you yeah. practice that, making space for that? Well, when I started painting again uh, a few years ago, I, I still had never showed anything to anyone. There were a lot of my friends who had no idea I'd ever painted before. And uh, Mindy, my wife gave me an easel for my birthday a few years ago with a bunch of friends around sitting around their backyard and she gives me this new easel and they're like, easel, what's that? <laughs> like, oh yeah, paint. And so, oh, let me see. And so I showed them some pictures on my phone and then I started painting more and more. And I had never had any intention of putting it in a gallery for people to come by. That's not what I was doing. I was painting for therapy, I guess, really for my own mm. benefit. But but they kind of started stacking up and there's a lot of them and it, we're in Taos. Um, and we're going through a gallery and talking to the um, woman here who owns this gallery. And um, she says, well, won't you come show your work here? I'm like, okay. <laughs> and so it was scary. And I did. And people bought it and people don't buy it. And I don't know. I just, um, I remember why I paint. It's not to sell it. Mm. If people want to buy it, that's great. I'm not doing it for the money. It's nice. And it's really, it's a huge compliment when someone would rather have my art than their money. Mm. Like, really? You, you like it more than <laughs> that's the, a great compliment. And, um, and when people don't, that's okay too. And I just have, you know, I, I, I firmly believe that it wasn't for them. If they don't see it, they don't appreciate it. They don't, it's okay. It wasn't for you anyway. I wasn't seeking you out to paint a commission for you to you know yeah maybe that's it I just that's not why I do it it's a great yeah. byproduct because it um keeps me going it pays for art supplies <laughs> <laughs> no, I love that you stay connected to your passion for the art and uh and that drives it and I know kind of circling back to like the preaching and it's the listening to the scripture and and just the the fire for that engagement that um, it's a scary thing to share, but it's a, it's also where it becomes a blessing. Two more questions I want to ask you, Kirk. The, you've talked about it a little bit so far in terms of attention, but is there anything else you would add about the role, your experience of the role of patience in creating? Mm. Yeah, like that waiting for paint to dry. Yes, um, yeah, yeah. Ma Makuto talked about last week. I've, I've painted some things really fast and I've painted some things really slow. And often the ones that I do really quickly without thinking, you know, too much turn out really amazing. Mm -hmm. And it's just real fast. I'm like, wow, that was cool. But when I take my time and I paint layers upon layers of transparent paint on another transparent paint, and before you can do that, you have to wait for that paint to dry before you come back with the next layer. Um, and over the course of several days, I'm coming back and I'm looking at it because as it dries, it's like, oh, that looks a little different than I remember. I think I'm gonna do this instead. And as you wait for that paint to dry before you come back and do the next thing, you often change your mind about mm. something and giving yourself the opportunity to decide, you know what, I think I'm gonna go a little different direction with this. And I truly get to enjoy the experience and awe of it all when I stop and take my time. I can't tell you how many times I've looked back at one of my paintings after it's finished and I've asked myself, 
wow, where'd that come from? There is absolutely no way I could paint that. Who did that? <laughs> I, I just, you know, don't know how it got there. And that's where patience comes in. Don't just rush through to finish this drawing. Um, mm -hmm. Just kind of follow your process and let it happen. Um, I've learned, I've gotten better at that over the years. It was really hard when I first started painting again to not finish a painting when I started it. Mm. A la prima is the, the word used for that all at once. And um, I still do a lot of a la prima painting. If you're outside painting what's called plein air, P-L-E-I-N. Plein air is a French term that just means out in the open. Yeah. Um, paint a la prima. You got to capture that really quickly because the sun's moving across the sky and the light's changing, the colors are changing. So you got to get it done pretty quickly. And a lot of times I'll paint something quickly and then I'll come back into the studio and I'll use that painting as my visual aid to paint a slower version of that. Um, and so it's interesting to see um, the difference between the two. I love that. Uh, it makes me think of a poem by Judy Brown. Uh, I hope it doesn't break up our momentum too much. I'll, I'll share because it it's kind of short, but kind of also beautiful on it in terms of on point with what you're saying. Uh, she says, what makes a fire burn is space between the logs, a breathing space. Too much of a good thing, too many logs packed in too tight can douse the flames almost as surely as a pail of water would. So building fires requires attention to the space in between as much as to the wood. When we are able to build open spaces in the same way we have learned to pile on the logs, then we can come how to see then we can come to see how it is fuel and absence of the fuel together that make fire possible we only need to lay a log lightly from time to time a fire grows simply because the space is there with openings in which the flame that knows just how it wants to burn can find its way wow i love that and then amazing because sometimes like you're right it just like happens it's like there and sometimes um you make the space, you put the transparent paint. That's one of the things that's kept me from becoming a virtuoso watercolor painter is I hate waiting to, <laughs> to let it dry before I come back and add some detail or something like that. Uh, and, and it challenges so much of our instincts for what productivity is. Uh, the, the slower path can be the infinitely more fruitful path sometimes. Kirk, you and I both appreciate the Japanese art of kintsugi, and we've talked about that some. Um, how can art point us to the redeeming possibilities of God? And I guess I, I should just say, and you can say more about this too, for, for those for whom kintsugi is new, kintsugi is the art of taking like a broken bowl of uh, pieces and putting it back together. And these, it might Maybe you knocked it off your shelf yesterday, but it could be a broken bowl from generations ago. Sometimes they'll keep the pieces for generations, consider them, but they'll put it back together. And where I might use uh, invisible super glue to make it look like it had never been broken, so I'm not in trouble. Kintsugi says, no, we're gonna embrace the cracks and they'll make like a golden mixture and put it back so that the, I don't have a picture with, with me to, to share, but um, you put the bowl back together where every crack now has golden, uh, mortar. And the idea is that this bowl is now more beautiful than it was before it was broken. So that's the just summary for those for whom that's new. But um, so it's this beautiful picture, not just of redemption, like restoration, but truly new creation, because it's more beautiful than it was before the, the shattering. How can art point us to the redeeming possibilities of God? And before you start, Kirk, I'm going to pull up the piece of art that you have said you want to talk about here for that. Yeah, I think, you know, to quote um, the Mr. Rogers of the art world, uh, Bob Ross. Yeah. Uh, there are no mistakes, only happy little accidents. Um, th that is true in art, but it's not true in life. Um, we do make mistakes, mm. sometimes make really bad mistakes, but our God, the great artist, um, can still use us to make beautiful and useful things like mm. they are of Kintsugi. Is it's not that the bowl is broken and you need to hide it. The cracks, the mending is now part of that bowl and part of the history of the bowl. And it's even more beautiful now that it's gone through its life and, and can still be you know, brought back together and made 
useful. It mm. may not be useful for the same thing it was used for before, but it can still be a useful and beautiful thing. So this painting that you're looking at here is that very thing. This is called Still Waters. And if you notice on the bottom of the painting, you see just a little bit of the, the waters, the edge of a pond there. Mm -hmm. This painting is actually painted on a uh, <clears throat> canvas on panel. So it's a really thin, um, it's just canvas wrapped around a really thin piece of board. So it's not on a thicker canvas, you know, that's wrapped on a frame. It was sitting on my easel and I had the thing just about finished and I bumped the easel and the painting slid down in the crack of the easel. Oh no. When I pulled it back up, the water became, the water appeared. I did not paint that water there. Originally that whole foreground came all the way forward. There were more plants and bushes and things like that. But oh, wow. Down, when I lifted it back up, it scraped all the paint down and created that little reflection that you see going down below. <laughs> and so I just took my palette knife, I put a little white on there and I put a couple of, put a little line here, a little line here to create just a couple little indications of, of water. But that whole thing was a mistake. It was an accident. I ruined the painting because it slipped behind the easel uh, in, in the frame. I pulled it out and it revealed itself. Mm. And so, again, are there no mistakes in art? Just happy little accidents? In this case, yes. And that's one example of many where I set out to do one thing and I totally destroyed. I, you know, I might have spent, I don't know, 10 or 15 hours on a painting and then in a matter of 30 minutes, I totally destroyed a, a quarter of it. And then I'll scrape it all off and it's just muddy and like, okay, well, that's ruined. And then later I found out, you know what? Maybe a tree needs to go there, a happy little mm. tree. And um, it can still be useful. And, um, I think someone actually bought that painting too. That's, I don't think that's here anymore. So yeah, our God, the great artist uh, can use our brokenness to uh, make beautiful, useful things. So we should never give up. Amen. That's that's a wonderful word for this season in particular. Makes me think of Will Will Willimon, the theologian. He was a one time. Well, I guess he's at, back at Duke Divinity School now. He said, you know, the the wonderful and terrible thing about being a Christian is you never know if you're standing on Good Friday or Easter Sunday. Uh, yeah. And and I think you just described that really beautifully. Well, thank you, Kirk. This has been a gift and a blessing. I appreciate your uh, sharing your experiences and inviting us into the process of the art you make and that we are blessed that you share uh, in this world. Thank you so much. It's been a lot of fun. I've enjoyed the conversation and uh, look forward to continuing it on as we do in the coming weeks.